So here, here are my disclosures. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say nobody really knows the answer to this question. And, and you have to ask yourself, why don't we really know the answer? And it's because studies addressing that exact question have never been attempted. There really is no data that you know, takes the younger patient and randomizes them to an intensive strategy versus a non-intensive strategy and then looks at long-term outcome. That kind of data just doesn't exist. So how did we get to the point where transplant has really become a standard? Well, if you go back, you know, 10, 15 years, we knew that the mantle cell outcomes were looking pretty dismal at that point and almost in desperation. And understandably, a lot of groups adopted very intensive strategies for their younger mantle cell patients. And then those trials have been published in the last five years. And the results have looked pretty good, actually, with um, reasonably, reasonably good progression-free survival and reasonably good overall survival. Really no plateau. There's really no hint that patients are being cured, but maybe a suggestion that people could be living longer. But then one has to ask the question, are these results due to the treatment intensity that's been applied? Is this due to patient selection, younger, healthier patients, or, or some aspect of both? So here's my opinion on the subject, and then I'll try to convince some of you to change your hand raising at the end. We'll see if I'm successful. Um, I think it is, uh, first of all, I think it's okay to watch selected mantle cell patients with watch and wait. Um, I, I do that commonly, actually. Uh, I have several patients that are under watch and wait right now as we speak in my practice. I do think that older patients do relatively well with m modern treatment strategies that are not intensive. I think the data would suggest that the younger patients are likely to derive a longer progression-free survival from intensive strategies, but I think the impact on the overall survival is quite murky, it's unclear. And for that reason, I have a conversation with my younger patients and I try to convey that fact. And I say to them that um, I think if you do an intensive strategy like a transplant, we will buy you a longer first remission. I think that's likely. You will also buy yourself more toxicity, more upfront toxicity with the transplant. And so there's a trade-off there. And I think the probability of being alive five years from now, 10 years from now, is roughly equivalent with the two different strategies. And we need to decide together where you want to, what direction you want to go, because now you're almost down to issues of patient preference, where there isn't a clear winner or loser in those two strategies, but two reasonable choices. <clears throat> so why don't we know the answer to these questions in a definitive way? Mantle cell's hard to study. You know, less than 10% of newly diagnosed patients, it's just very difficult to do the right kind of studies that get to these questions in a definitive way. Uh, just a couple of quick slides on mantle cell. I know you all know what it is. It used to be hard to diagnose, it's not anymore. Uh, it has a fairly characteristic morphology. It has a fairly characteristic immunophenotype. The cells should be CD5 positive. They should be bright CD20 and 20, CD23 negative. Should stain positive for cyclin D1. Should have an 1114 translocation detectable by fish. Clinically, kind of a typical pattern, much more common in men as you know. Median age is about 64. That's an important thing to remember. Most patients present with advanced stage disease. Leukemic phase, not uncommon. B symptoms, not uncommon. GI tract, commonly involved. High LDH, high beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, it has a moderately aggressive clinical course, and it has a relatively poor prognosis. By that, I mean relative to some other lymphomas. So this is, when I came out of my fellowship in 2000, you know, this is what all the curves look like, and this is what I would quote new, newly diagnosed mantle cell patients. The median overall survival was about three, three and a half years, and it was that kind of data that really got the whole push going for these intensive treatment strategies. But it's important to remember that it's a fairly heterogeneous disease, and I'm sure folks have seen that in their own practice. And this particular study 
I think highlights that very nicely where a group of investigators did something called a proliferation signature, gene expression profiling and mantle cell biopsies, and they divided patients into quartiles. And so about 25% of the patients have this really aggressive clinical course. And about 50% of the patients, I should point over here, I'm pointing down here where nobody can see. About 50% of the patients have the very typical course, but then about 25% of the patients have a fairly indolent course. And I, this is honestly what I see in my own practice. Now, unfortunately, we can't do gene expression profiling to identify who these patients are. We do have this tool called the MIPI, mantle cell IPI, and this is a moderately useful tool. I don't think it's incredibly useful in practice. The four factors that have been associated with prognosis are performance status, LDH, white blood cell count, and age. And the reason I don't think it's incredibly useful in practice is that a lot of times what gets patients into a high risk category is older age and poor performance status, which aren't really conducive for intensifying therapy. So I don't find it very helpful in those instances where sometimes it's helpful. Um, you might have a patient who's right on the right on the edge, you know, maybe a 55-year-old or let's say a 60-year-old, and you're having those conversations, should we go intensive? Could we maybe skip the intensive strategy? And, you know, maybe you could look at the MIPI score in that case, and it might nudge you one way or the other. So I'll use it in instances like that. Whoops. So... So what do you do when it's time to manage your mantle cell patient. Like I said, I, I don't think there's a standard of care. Um, I don't think mantle cell is reliably curable. And as I said, intensive strategies likely prolong the first remission, but the impact on overall survival is unclear. And the result is that you have several reasonable treatment options. So I said earlier, I think it's okay to watch and wait. And uh, the group from Cornell has actually published data on this. And what you can see in the bar graph over here is at their medical center, there are about 100 patients who started off on that kind of a strategy. And the, the reality is most patients move on to therapy within the first year. But that's okay if you start out on watch and wait. There was no detriment in terms of the overall survival for the patients who, whose their therapy was deferred. And if you adjust for when you actually started the treatment, the blue group is the deferred group. There's no detrimental impact on those patients for waiting. And you will find this minority of patients, maybe 15%, 20%, 10%, somewhere in there, who can be watched a very long period of time. And for those patients, it's a very uh, good strategy. And you learn a lot about those patients during that period of observation. Maybe you have someone who's low tumor burden, asymptomatic, but they progress pretty quickly in the first three months or six months. That might change my whole thinking about how to manage that patient. So I think you can get a lot of useful information if you have a patient who's a candidate for watch and wait. So I think that strategy is perfectly acceptable for the asymptomatic uh, low tumor burden patient. When it is time to treat, here's an example of some of the things that are reasonable treatments. And so we've broken them down into less intensive and more intensive, less intensive things like R-CHOP or R-bendamustine with or without maintenance rituximab. Radioimmunotherapy has been used as consolidation. We did a regimen at Wisconsin called modified hyper-CVAD. Here are the more intensive strategies. Our CHOP followed by stem cell transplant, very common strategy in the US. There's some data now that our CHOP with our DHAP gets you a better progression-free survival than this strategy and borderline statistically significant overall survival advantage. So this would be a reasonable intensive strategy. Uh, MD Anderson style hyper is, is a reasonable intensive strategy or the so-called Dordic regimen. So what does an intensive strategy get you for a younger mantle cell patient? So this is just a summary of a few of these trials. The top two are one, two different arms of one study from the European Mantle Cell Consortium. This was a CLGB study published recently in the JCO. Here's the Nordic regimen. Here's the MD Anderson data. If you just kind of aggregate them, 95% of people go into some sort of remission. The complete remission rates are in the 60 to 70% range, and 
The median event free survival tends to be around four to five years for the intensive strategy. That's a pretty, pretty good ballpark estimate. So what if we compare that to a non-transplant or a non-intensive strategy? And for this, I'm not going to focus on progression-free survival. I'm kind of admitting that these regimens, these strategies are likely to lose in a progression-free survival argument. Rather, I'm going to focus on overall survival. And there really is very little data to look at because um, there are no trials that have looked specifically at non-intensive strategies in younger patients. And comparing older to younger is just not fair for outcomes. So, but here's two examples that I thought could illustrate the point. The group here from Cornell using non-intensive strategies has published on 111 patients. And if you look at the overall survival at five years without intensive strategies, it's 66%, which is right in the ballpark of a CLGB study with a comparable number of patients and a comparable follow-up using a very intensive strategy with high-dose cytarabine, high-dose methotrexate, and a stem cell transplant. In ECOG, we just completed a trial a couple of years ago called E1405. We presented that at ASH last year. Most of the patients received a non-intensive strategy, and with mature follow-up, um, our five-year overall survival is 80%. Now, some of the patients were allowed to get a stem cell transplant in that trial. We left it up to the physician. That was a minority. And if you look at the outcomes between the transplanted patients and the non-transplanted patients, they're identical. There's absolutely no difference. So it's not like the transplanted patients are pulling the curve up. So I think here are two fairly contemporary data sets with older patients, mind you, compared to these intensive strategy uh, trials suggesting that you get comparable overall survival with a non-intensive strategy. We, um, the reason I'm comfortable with this is this is the way we've been doing it at Wisconsin for many years now. We've done three sequential studies where we use the modified hypercevad and two years of maintenance rituximab. In our second generation, we added bortezomib into the induction and we tried a longer maintenance course, no transplant. And then we did the ECOG study, which I just mentioned, looking at the same induction with a shorter maintenance course. And if you just put that data together, if you look at the probability of being alive at five years, 64% in our first trial, 80% in our second trial, and 84% in the third trial, reflecting perhaps the different errors, but again, very good overall survival at five years using a non-intensive strategy, and that's why I have become very comfortable with that approach. Why are people doing better than they were when I started this uh, in 2000, um, coming out of fellowship? Well, possibly transplant is helping, but we have a lot of new agents in mantle cell lymphoma with activity. Bortezomib, FDA approved for relapsed mantle cell. Bendamustine has come along. Uh, Zevalin, mTOR inhibitors. Lenalidomide is now approved for recurrent mantle cell lymphoma. The lenalidomide rituximab combination looks particularly potent. Uh, we heard a few minutes ago in indolent lymphoma about um, the agent that's now called idelalisib. And then most of you are probably aware of the abrutinib data in mantle cell lymphoma that was published in New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago with very impressive um, response rates and progression-free survival. And there's another agent that's looking quite good in mantle cell lymphoma, which is a a selective BCL2 inhibitor. So these things have all probably made an impact in the relapse disease, and some of these agents are, have now moved into frontline, and so we have that as a non-intensive option for frontline treatment. This is just a subset of patients from the STILL trial, mantle cell patients who were randomized to bendamustine rituximab or CHOP rituximab. There were about 100 mantle cell patients, and this is the bendamustine rituximab curve here, which beat the CHOP rituximab curve by about a year. And we have the idea of maintenance rituximab as another non-intensive um, therapeutic option for, for our mantle cell patients. So this, this trial was specifically done for elderly, but could this be extrapolated to younger patients? Certainly, we've been doing the maintenance rituximab strategy at Wisconsin for about 12 years now. So this was a trial for 
older patients, they had an RCHOP or an FCR induction, randomized then responders to maintenance rituximab or interferon. And what I want to show you here is just really, again, specifically an older patient population, the excellent long-term survival for the patients who received the two different strategies where here's five years right here and we're up for the maintenance rituximab group close to 80% in an older patient population. So, so to, to sort of bring it all in, this is my current approach to an older mantle cell patient, someone who I wouldn't even consider an intensive strategy. I usually will talk to them about rituximab bendamustine as an induction, and I'll recommend that we do maintenance rituximab for two years. This is a bit of an extrapolation of existing data. I took the Benda from the r still trial and the maintenance rituximab from the European mantle cell study I just showed you. You could certainly do R-CHOP followed by maintenance rituximab. That would be perfectly acceptable as well. And this has formed the backbone of a current intergroup trial in which all patients receive this bendamustine rituximab backbone for six cycles and then two years of rituximab maintenance with randomizations to either have bortezomib built into your induction, yes or no, and then either lenalidomide rituximab maintenance or just rituximab maintenance. And when this trial was designed, we designed it specifically for the older patients, but the trial has just been amended to also in, uh, allow younger patients, sort of proving to you all that we're comfortable with the idea of younger patients going on a specifically non-intensive treatment strategy. Okay, so what do you do with the younger patient in which the intensive strategy is an option. <clears throat> so that's where I'll have that long conversation. And I'll go through my preferred non-intensive option, and then I will go through one of the intensive options. I, of these, personally, I like the Nordic regimen, but I think all of them are quite reasonable. And I'll go through the pros and the cons of intensive versus non-intensive. I'll go through the trade-off, and we'll make a decision together. And some patients will pick the intensive, some patients will pick the non-intensive, and I'm comfortable with either strategy. So I'm not trying to talk you out of transplant, but I am saying if you choose not to do it, in my opinion, that's okay. So um, the reason it's okay is the NCN guidelines say it's, NCCN guidelines say it's okay. They list five different intensive options and they list six different intensive options. So clearly they're not sure what the right answer is either so you don't need to feel bad about it. I don't know what the right answer is either. We don't have a standard. Uh, if you do have a clinical trial, that's always a good option for mantle cell. We'd like to establish standards. We're certainly trying to do that in the US cooperative groups. And hopefully I've shown you uh, that there are some really exciting new agents that are working their way into frontline, which I think could fundamentally change the whole treatment paradigm in mantle cell lymphoma. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat>